Okay, hurling legend and current senior Kilkenny hurling selector DJ Carey was at the Airgrid official timing sponsorship launch which was happening today. Now Airgrid, the state-owned company that develops and manages the flow of electricity across Ireland, has been a proud partner of the GEA since 2015. Delighted to say that DJ Carey is with us now. How are you getting on DJ? I'm good, I'm good, and yourself? Very well thanks. So 25 days out is what I'm seeing here from Kilkenny's championship opener, a do or die clash against Dublin or Leash. Does it feel like that, that you're just over three weeks away from such a huge fixture? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny one, to be honest, because, um, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're in winter and uh, we're just basically back a couple of weeks now with, with, the, with the county team. Obviously, uh, we were looking at the club action up to now. So it's a, it's a little bit unusual and um, it, it's, it's just one of these things that, you have to start. We are obviously getting prepared for, and Dublin leash, uh, Dublin our leash is a huge one for us. But it's very unusual uh, in in so far as you know, it's the year has been so long. Uh, now, not that it's long for us in terms of training because we wouldn't have done much. But uh, we're now at the back end of the year, so it's um, it's a bit unusual, all right. But it's something that everyone has have to get their heads around. How are you enjoying your role as selector? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, uh, we're busy with club action there um, over the summer, so uh, so it's it's enjoyable. But obviously, there's 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 a serious side to it, and then there's the serious side is selecting, uh, and then there's a, a side to it whereby you know um, we can only select uh, eventually only fifteen and twenty six to to play. So that's the difficult one um, when it actually comes to the to the crunch of picking a team and a panel. You're leaving off. We have 36 presently uh, on the panel. So, you know, we can only pick 26 for a match. So that's, that's a difficult one. It's interesting how the, the, the success that you've had so early on in, in, in your coaching career, uh, it, it looked last year as if there might be a little bit of a time away from the game, perhaps this year. And then uh, the phone call comes from Brian Cody and it's an impossible thing to say no to. Uh, are you happy you said yes? Are you, are you happy you went back in? Of, of course, what's happened since then has obviously been incredible for, for everybody in the world. Yeah, yeah. Look, I enjoy it. Sure. Look, uh, if you have an opportunity of of uh, being uh, in with a legend of the, of the game, sure. You know, it's 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 great in itself. I I you know I've never been overly ambitious to um, to coach or to certainly manage. You know, I I enjoy it. It's a big part of my life. Uh, I have to. Uh, one time I had two very small young fellas, and uh, now they're pretty big. Uh, so you, I would have gone to all their games and um, done very little coaching with them uh, in the past uh, until the last couple of years. And uh, so you were, I was always involved in some shape or form. And then Carlo IT was a was a big one for me for the last uh, eight or nine years, and that brought me kind of back into the game. Uh, and obviously, the Kilkenny under. 21s and 20s, uh, you know, so I had my, you know, I had my couple of years doing it at uh, under uh, 21 and 20 level with Kilkenny and then, you know, I was going to step aside and uh, the call did come. So, yeah, look, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It was something I wasn't expecting, um, you know, but it, it came, I thought about it uh, and uh, now involved. The year is very, very unusual, mm. uh, but, um, you know, I suppose, it's it's a great honour for me to be involved with Brian. Was it a deliberate thing that you mentioned there, not getting involved with the the coaching of of your kids and stuff like that? Was that was that a very deliberate decision to to stay away from that at underage level? Um, well, well, I suppose in some ways yes, but uh, my circumstances would have been slightly different. Mm. I would have been living in Dublin, mm. uh, you know, while the lads were in Kilkenny at the time. Uh, so I wouldn't have certainly had the time to do it, even though I, I would rarely have missed a match. Um, but I think it was important maybe that they were, when they were growing up that they were uh, being coached by different players, good, bad or indifferent or uh, different coaches, you know, because you have to learn from everyone. You have to have discipline, um, you know, and, and some, some fellas have different ideas. And I think that's all always good um, to get to have different ideas and as I say some I don't think there's any magic formula in the game I don't think I have any magic formula towards anyone else but it's always different to get uh, someone else's view but ultimately you know it's down to a player themselves to improve you can't blame a manager you can't blame a coach uh, if you want to improve at any level at any sport in the classroom music or anything it's ultimately down to yourself
Mm, for sure. How different is the dynamic between you and Brian Cody from when you were a player to now as one of the coaches with him? Is there a different dynamic there? Well, obviously, you, you, see, uh, you see a different side to a person when you're very much working closely and you're, you're picking players uh, rather than as, as a player, you know, and, and I probably, I was involved in the beginning of Brian's inter-county uh, career, as in coaching career, uh, and maybe I was only there for four or five years, so he's there a long time now. Um, but it would have been different, obviously, as a player. There's a certain distance that that is kept, and I think um, you know there has to be a certain amount. If you need to talk to a player, well, that's that's one thing. But uh, as a selector, you're you're very closely involved, and you're very closely involved in the inner thoughts of of someone, what he thinks of a player, what you think of a player. Uh, maybe you differ, and we do differ on on certain things, um, you know. But by and large. To differ is good, uh, but your your goal is the one thing. When you say that he may think something different about a player to what you think, what is the thing about a player that impresses Brian Cody more than anything else? Well, obviously, it's it's Brian Cody's. You know, work rate was a big thing for Brian. You know, um, <clears throat> look at at the end of the day, we would expect at this level, or as as any management in any county. You are getting players at the very highest level mm. in in your county. So, from a, a coaching point of view, you shouldn't be needing to coach a guy the simple uh, basics of the game because they have it at that level. Now it's trying to put a team together. Now it's time to, you know, maybe tactically put tactics together uh, and go out and do it. You're not teaching a guy how to catch a ball or strike a ball or you know rise a ball. That's that should be already done. Um, so it's 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 from I suppose Brian's point of view, it's trying to to manage that and uh, you know also you know whatever way the game is changing, he has to analyze that and say, well, do we go with that or do we not? And uh, some you do and some you don't, and that that means then we have to try and put as much of that into training as possible. You mentioned there that sometimes Brian has a distance that he keeps with players, which kind of needs to be done if you're going to make ruthless decisions, which are required at the very top level. One of the ways that that distance often manifests itself in the stories that we hear is from players who leave the Kilkenny panel, players who retire, and the story that they, they tell of uh, ringing up Brian Cody and, and telling him that they're, they're hanging up the hurley and uh, Brian Cody may often not be the, give, give the warmest reception back in certain cases. What was that like for you? Do you remember that moment when uh, you actually decided to, to, to hang up the black and amber anyway, for Kilkenny? Yeah, look, I, I, I suppose... Um... You know, I, I, I retired at 36 years of age. Mm. Yeah, well, sorry, I was going to be 36 in that year. So I, I couldn't have any complaints. And, and to be honest, for the previous couple of years, you know, in 2002, I had a number of reasonably poor, bad, when I said bad injuries. I, I, in the 2001 county final, I tore the hamstring off the bone. Uh, I actually had a, a pulled hamstring going into the first match it went to a replay I played in the replay and obviously it did a lot of damage so I was going to be out for a long period of time um, I had a disc removed in my neck uh, during that year as well and I think around May or around that time I had a burst appendix in 2002 so my year was gone it was yeah. shot you know um, and sometime around the end of June uh, around that time I'd done a, a a, an interview with Vincent Hogan and we left it in such a way that you can never say never you know I didn't retire from the game I just thought my year was shot which was gone uh, and Kenny didn't score a goal in the Leinster final of that year and you know Brian I got a phone call about nine o'clock the following morning uh, from Brian and he said look you made a statement there yesterday that never was never uh, or you didn't you know might, mightn't be and uh, or it didn't mean never. Sure. Um, I think that was a statement. I can't remember exactly. Um, you can you can never say never. That was the statement. And um, he said, look, uh, would you come back? Would you train? I said, sure, Brian, I haven't trained since the county final last November. I haven't been able to do a thing. Uh, you know me, like I, I like to be in the, the top, as top shape as possible. And uh, he said, look, he said, we have six weeks when all are in the semi-final. And he said, come in and train with us for six weeks. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Uh, but if it does, 
would love to have you as part of some uh, some part of the panel or even team if if you're able to get that far. So I trained reasonably hard for the six weeks. So I would never have been in bad shape, but I certainly wasn't fit and trained hard and played in the All Ireland semi final against Tipperary and played in the All Ireland final. So from the point of view of um, I, I was brought, but John Power had, uh, you know, a few years previous, wasn't on the panel, Brian brought him back. Mm. Then, you know, he retired again later on. So from the point of view, he felt there was something left there, there was something left there. And, you know, I suppose a lot of players feel there's that little bit more in you. Like, I retired in 2006 and Kenny won four Irelands in a row. Yeah. A lot of people said to me, you could have been there, you could have won another four, you could have been, ended up as a goalkeeper, you could have ended up as this. My time was gone. My time was finished at 36 years of age. Um, and that was it. And, you know, I know I've seen David Herity come out, I've seen, you know, Jackie Tyrrell, you know, a few lads, even Charlie Carter back in my time. And uh, I suppose ultimately, if you make a decision, that's, that's a decision. And I think Brian's attitude, even with myself, you know, if you've made a decision to go, that's your decision. You know, and uh, there's someone, it's, it's probably not his, it's probably not for him to say, lads, I'm begging you to hurl. Because the way he looks at it is that, you know, if you want to hurl, and you're good enough to hurl, you'll be there. If you mm. don't want to hurl, if you want to retire, it's not up to him to change your mind. Now, look, I don't know. Maybe he has changed other people's minds in the past. I don't know. Um, but certainly from my point of view, I met Brian. I said, I'm thinking of return. Uh, and Brian said, well, it's up to yourself. Look, as usual, when you came back in 2002, there was no guarantee of you being on the team. Uh, now there's no guarantee of you being on the team. We'd like you to be part of the panel. Uh, and part of it and if you make it you make it if you don't you don't but if your mind is made up and I said it was because at that time I was travelling up and down from Dublin uh, and the hunger wasn't there just it's when it goes it goes and maybe for the previous one or two years you know I wasn't you know I, I obviously was hungry for the game but I'd been missing a little bit more and more maybe through injury or through the fact that, you know, there was other things also, you know, you'd work or whatever it was, was in your life, you were coming from Dublin and maybe it was time for me to go. Mm, that's interesting. So I guess part of the reason why people feel a little bit of coldness from Brian Cody when they retire is almost on the person who's retiring shoulders. They feel that they still have something to offer almost. Their subconscious is telling them that. And Brian Cody believes that once you've actually put the foot forward and say that you're leaving, for the most part, anyway, your your time is up, really, because mentally you've you've checked out a little bit. Yeah, well, I suppose if it even if it was myself, and you know, over over a couple of you know, even like uh, as I say, I was manager, so particularly with Kenny under twenties and twenty ones, you know, and you, you, so some guys are injured for a long period of time, and and you need to go to them and you need to say, you know, like you you're in here every night, you're getting injured, you know, I have to say to you that you might be better off going away. And maybe even taking a year off, maybe taking the next three months off, uh, even though your ambition is to make this team is to make a senior team. But you can't be in here trying to give it your best, being injured, going to uh, the, the, the physio every night, not being properly able to train. You know, maybe it's time to actually take a rest, a break from the game. OK, now I'm going away from it a little bit here. But if, if you're actually if it's in your head and if you have to get clarification, maybe from a manager or maybe, it's, you know, to say, Right, I'm thinking about it here. Um, I don't think Brian is probably that man is going to turn around to you and 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 change your mind if if your mind is is made up. And like intercounty hurling, and if I was looking at it from an outside, you'd probably be very critical of Dave Perity retiring, and you know because he was a young guy, a fantastic goalkeeper. Why is he retiring? You know, you don't know the in and outs until it comes out later on. You know, and and like. I, I would say that the vast majority of players, the vast majority of, if Brian Cody turned around to me in 2006 and said, we really need you, we want you on the team, maybe there's another year. I don't know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, but I was, I was prepared to go because I was prepared to go the year before. Um, and, and maybe that's the way with a, with a lot of players as well. I, I think Jackie Tyrrell might have felt he could have came on and offered something in an All-Ireland final against Tipperary or Cork. I can't remember exactly which one. Maybe it's Tipperary. You know, and, and, and we as players, you think maybe there's a bit more, but when you're looking at it then as a selector from the outside, maybe you're looking at it a little bit differently. 
you know so yeah to, to actually marry that is difficult and and i often would say um you know when i when i was manager i'm going to you know you're going to talk to players you're going to coach them individually you're going to do but actually when you're in that scenario you actually don't get that time because you know by and large you're actually meeting a player at training on the field and you have five minutes to say look there's a place for you on this team but I don't know, is your attitude right? So let's up the attitude. You know, so I'm not sure you actually exactly get that amount of time that you think you're going to get mm. with a player. And maybe the player themselves feel, oh, well, that fellow's cold and he wasn't looking at me and I let in a goal or I, I missed a free and now I'm all, all of a sudden taken off the freeze. You know, or whatever that is. Um, you know, you think there's an awful lot more to it. Uh, you think there's an awful lot more time involved. You think there's an awful lot more personal one-to-ones. But I'm not talking about any individual here now sure. at all. But sometimes you meet a player and you go to him and you say to him, you know, how do you feel? I'm okay. Um, we, you're going to be a sub, okay. You're going to be a sub today. You know, or you're not under the, You get very little interaction back to you. You know, so when you want to have a conversation with a player, the actual interaction back to you is not great as well. And what I found that, I found that out with ourselves, you know, as, as management, you need that interaction back as well. And I know, I do know for a fact with Brian, Brian will test you, you know, Brian could say to me, Oh, you don't like a player, which I, as you know, but that's his way of testing you. You know, right. you don't, you might even know that player, you know, but that's his way of coming in with a conversation. And I think if you're in bad form, which we all can be in bad form at times, or when you don't hear what you want to hear. Um, I think that, um, you know, you can go away with, a, with, with, with that sort of thing too, you know. But I think from the point of view of management, I'm not sure what is the nicest way of any player return in any county. You'll mm-hmm. hear about Brian Cody because he's around for a long time, but do we hear about other managements, the conversations, what conversation? He can be the nicest person in the world. I would count myself as a person who would be soft. I would hate, I actually hate giving someone bad news. You know, and you go to a player and say, look, you're not on the panel today and you might get a one word answer. Now, it's not not vulgar. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's OK. But the, the interaction is not there. And it's very hard to have interaction with a player that's not willing to give that back. You know, yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, I, I guess that's definitely part of it that Cody's been around for so long. And also because the players who have retired have generally won a heap of All-Ireland medals and are very high profile and everybody wants to hear from them, you know, so that, that, that probably paints a picture as well. Uh, it, yeah. it's, it's interesting that you talk about retiring before the four in a row. Is there ever any part of you that felt regret around that period, even though deep down you knew that your body wasn't going to be able to keep going? Was, it, was there ever anything inside your head thinking, oh God, I, I, I wish, I'm sorry I missed out on that unbelievable run of All-Ireland's? Uh, well, yes, if I was younger, but uh, no, in the sense of um, I felt that uh, I I didn't retire until Kilkenny won the National League of two thousand and six, and I felt that Kilkenny were in a really good place. Was I in shape? I had no weight on me. I was reasonably fit. I was after I was slowing down, obviously. <laughs> Uh, at at that age for the game, that was. But I felt I had given it everything I had to give, uh, and I got more out of it. As I say, my career was extended in two thousand and two. I captained Kilkenny in two thousand and three. I played in the All Ireland of two thousand and four. I played in the All Ireland semi final of two thousand and five. You know, from a point where I thought maybe my career was ended in two thousand and two because of injury. Um, so at at that stage. I, I had been on the Kilkenny panel since 1988. It was a long time. Uh, and I knew from the previous year or two, uh, you know, before I was, the, I was always the fellow that was in the top two or three when it came to laps around the field. I was always in the top one or two when it came to sprinting. I was always that guy. Now I was near the, very much near the other end because fellas were just bypassing me. And I just felt that, you know, to, to play at the highest level, did I want to be a sub? Absolutely not. If I was a sub because I wasn't good enough, that was fine if I was committed to it. But I, it wasn't that I needed all Ireland medals in my pocket uh, to, to glorify a career. As far as I was concerned, I had a brilliant career. 
uh, in terms of, I'm not saying I was brilliant hurler. I had a brilliant career. I played in nine All Ireland finals, you know. Uh, and anyone that could turn around and say you played nine, nine All Ireland finals, and even though we lost them, I wouldn't give one of them up for a second, you know. And even though you might have regrets, even though I might have scored in one or two, there's no way I would have given. The, 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 the experience was absolutely uh, phenomenal every single time that I played, and and I just felt that you know what, to be able to compete at the very highest level, why should I take so why should I take a place of someone that was that was now about to start in the career? Because I wanted to sit on the bench to be a sub to 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 have a, an extra medal. There was no need for it. Yeah, it, it's interesting as well. We, we've we were doing a, a series during lockdown. Uh, the, the the Mount Rushmore of every county, the, the four greatest sports people. We went and did thirty two of them. The Kilkenny one actually ended up being quite controversial, um, not because of you, but because uh, Henry Shefflin and Brian Cody were both left off it. Uh, the thing about the Mount Rushmore in that particular case was that you were a non-negotiable. You were up on the mountain immediately and the selector said, DJ's up there anyway. It's a question of whether Henry or Brian Cody or both or none of them goes up there. Like, I know you're probably, maybe you'll give a modest answer to this, but why do you think that is? Why do you think you're the person that people look to as the figurehead of a great few decades for Kilkenny Hurling? I, I don't know to be honest. I, 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 and I sometimes I find it hard to understand that. To, to me, just uh, Henry when he came was 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 just phenomenal. Brian, with his achievements both as a player, a, a captain, and and manager, w- was phenomenal. And I, I, I just don't know. Um, I often hear that maybe I didn't play in a stronger team, but our team was strong. With just the teams that were awfully Wexford, uh, all these teams were very strong. It's 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 a phenomenal honour. I have to say to be like like if like to be compared with Henry Shefflin or to be compared with obviously Brian is a different thing because he's better known probably as the manager, um, but to be compared with Christy Ring or to be compared with the modern day hurlers that are out there present is a tremendous honour and and like like you know I I like flabbergasted at, ty- at times when I hear that now I'd never seen Christy Ring playing and and a lot of the players of the past like that but when you look at some of the present players from my era onwards the 90s onwards I'm flabbergasted to even think that you're still up there so it's a tremendous honour and that's not me trying to say oh look at his look for notice because it's just that when you look at even if look at the Kilkenny team, when you look at Owen Larkin, how brilliant he was. When you look at Richie Power, how brilliant these guys were. Do you know what I mean? And I'm there forward, I'm like not alone to Tommy Welsh, JJ Laney, Noel Hickey. Any of these guys were just phenomenal in their time. And there was just a wave of them over a 10 or 11 year period. So it's a great honour. I, I, I don't know um, why, except I would imagine that there is a, a, a huge amount of people that saw me in my career who might be my age and older uh, who 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 loved that era of the game? Uh, but I would imagine, like there would be there would be very few even in my own club now, young fellas. If you're if they were picking a favourite hurler, who would even have ever seen me hurl? So it's the likes of Henry, or even it's the likes of the modern day guy now. T.J. Reid would obviously be a big one in Kilkenny. So mm. I would imagine the modern young fella now wouldn't have seen that. Uh, the, the one thing, though, that uh, will stand you in good stead over time for those younger fellas in the club is YouTube uh, and the fact that uh, clips are available to, to watch back and things like that for, for generations to come. And I guess for Henry, uh, maybe not so much for the backs now, but for Henry and yourself, there will be a collection of goals. There will be a collection of big moments that, that, that you came up with on the biggest days. Uh, like that's a, a very interesting conversation to get into about how you become a hurler who's known for goal scoring and, and, and for the, the, those exploits in front of goal that taking your points was not always an option for you. Like, I mean, we saw that goal in the, in the Tipperary County final a couple of weeks ago, the Kiladangan goal, the going for that when the, the point was on, even in the football with David Clifford a couple of weeks ago. Like, yeah. what, 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 could you explain to us that, that mindset, that, that, uh, that, that mindset that you would have had where the risk of missing actually didn't really compute with the massive upshot of getting a green flag raised on a big day? Well, I, I grew up and I went to, to a little school in Gorn and we had two teachers called John Ox and Dick O'Neill. And uh, I was probably, I don't know, four foot five or whatever it was. I was a small fellow. And uh, they just encouraged me when I got the ball, just because I was quick, a goal, just goal. And I grew up with that kind of all my life. And I brought that as well in, to senior and it was that 
like I, I got as much satisfaction out of creating a goal as it is scoring. Now it's great to be on charts of scoring goals, um, but but creating a goal is every bit you know taking on a man, taking on a second guy, laying off a pass, a ball being in the back of the net. Like Jimmy Coogan, I I'm often referred to as Jimmy Coogan getting a goal against the career. <laughs> that gives me as much satisfaction of of scoring it myself. But I, I was always uh, that's the way I was brought up. Anything you know, if you had any got inside a player at all, you were gone. Uh, there was a goal chance on, and I probably missed as many goal chances as I as I scored. But to, to, it was a great satisfaction, it was brilliant, and obviously a great uh, lift to get in and and score a goal. And I I love the fact you know anyone that um, you know that goal in the Tipperary count that that would give me great satisfaction because there was a point on, uh, and probably the best option was to take the point, take it to extra time. But uh, the head was put down, and 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 obviously, you know, I can't remember his name now. But um, the fact that his head was down, goal was on his mind, and took it absolutely brilliantly would lead me to think that he's a goal scorer. Yeah, uh, like I guess what you said there about the idea of um, thinking that you won't score half the effort you take is almost part of actually scoring loads of goals. That that realization and that comfort and the fact that. Some of these are not going to hit the back of the net. But sorry, I was just looking out for the the, the Kiladangan uh, goal scorer to to to, to, to use. Brian McLaughney is uh, Brian the, McLaughlin, the, the, yeah. the guy I was looking for there. Ha, who taught you this, then, uh, DJ? Just to, to to wrap up on this point, was there somebody who, who pulled you aside at an early point in your hurling life, or how did you find that that eye for goal that that set you apart? Well, we will, as I said, I went to a little school and. Um, if you hit the ball over the bar in the school, it was gone out into another field and you mightn't get it. So mm. a lot of what we had to do in school was score goals. So it was, <laughs> so like the, 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 the score in a match might be 10 goals and two points to nine goals and two points, you know? So it was all, yeah. a lot of it was goals. The pitch was small and there was many players on it. So you had to score. So I grew up kind of uh, scoring goals. And then, then as it led on and, and, I, I think there was always a great boost. Uh, goal was always a huge boost uh, because, like, g- great games in our times was maybe two fifteen to you know three nine or three ten, whatever it was. Now you could have twenty five, twenty six, thirty points in a game. You know, because the fact that the ball travels so far, guys are brilliant strikers now on the run. They can hit the ball over from the middle of the field. In our day, in our day, like a sixty five. A 65-yard free was a brilliant score. It was a long-distance yeah. free. So that meant the full forward line was getting huge amount of balls. You, you can see nowadays that, that um, forwards don't even bother following in a ball. When a ball goes in, they assume it's gone over the bar. Mm. And that's a bugbearer of mine. And it doesn't always happen. It's just that that's the way it is. Because corner forwards, full forwards, they're coming out to field looking for the short pass. In our day, the, even the best of a striker... Uh, if it was 40 yards out, you were expecting them to miss it. You know, yeah. so a lot, of, a lot of goals in the past were got because a ball was mishit and it came into you and you're around the goal or there was room. I, I, when I played, I played on a corner back, I played on a full back, whatever it was, or a wing back. You were playing on that guy for the game. Now, maybe he was changed or you were changed to a different position, but you weren't playing on the same guy. He didn't follow you all over the field. Now, you're followed all over the field. You go with the man you're on. In my day, if I was so run through with a ball, uh, at the corner back or fullback might come to me you'd lay it off uh, nowadays very rarely will a corner you, the fella that's following you is the guy that's on you to try and hook you or block you you know so the games are just different uh, now so when you get a half opportunity the ball is put over the bar because a pint is a great score yeah. uh, and, and very rarely now do I see goals being worked goals happen that there's a ball put in maybe a fella running off the shoulder and bang is in Whereas in our day, you work a goal, if that makes sense to yeah. you. Uh, you turn a lad, you go with it, someone comes to you, you lay it off. Um, and I think it's, it's much different now. A goal happens in a game now, whereas a lot of in, in my day and previous that, it, you worked a goal. Right. There's a lot more planning that went into the move then. A little bit, because once you saw a guy moving, well, then that's where the plan came into place. Right. That is very interesting. Um, DJ, it's been great chatting to you. Just a, a reminder that DJ is with us as part of the Airgrid official timing sponsorship launch. Airgrid, the state-owned company that develops and manages the flow of electricity across Ireland, has been a proud partner of GEA since 2015. Uh, best of luck with the championship 
DJ, whether it's uh, Dublin or Leash. I uh, hope the year goes well for you. Please, God, we'll, we'll chat again soon.